Hi everyone. One of you emailed me to ask, could, could I upload some of the outtakes from the, the Quantum World videos? If I were to do that, you'd basically have hours and hours of footage going beep, 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 beep. That would be all, just swearing upon swearing upon swearing. So, we're into the home stretch. We're definitely into the home stretch. And the last few videos, going to focus on a number of fascinating topics. Of course, everything's fascinating in the quantum world. We're going to start with something called the simple harmonic oscillator, or something you're very, very familiar with. You've seen in a number of contexts. And the simple harmonic oscillator is just the reason we focus so much on it, and the reason it crops up in so many of your modules in different contexts and in disguise sometimes is because it's absolutely ubiquitous across physics and across science. Because once we want to describe vibrating systems, oscillating systems, be they atoms, be they molecules, be they bridges, be they fluids, be they solids, be they whatever, at some level, we're gonna come back to the simple harmonic oscillator and build up from that foundation. And in the context of the quantum world, simple harmonic oscillator, simple harmonic oscillation is so essential, particularly when we go all the way down to the, the atomic structure of matter, the molecular structure of matter. We can't reach absolute zero. Classical thermodynamics tells us that. You'll see that in st uh, thermal and statistical physics. Quantum mechanics tells us that, and you'll see just why soon. It's the uncertainty principle, spoiler. So that means everything at an atomic, molecular, quantum level, there's oscillation, there's vibration. And for those of you who did Frontiers last year, um, you'll have come across something called the Leonard-Jones potential. For those of you who haven't, don't worry, I'm about to give you a quick, very quick prissy of what this is all about. Uh, let's write it like that. Potential of interaction between two atoms is a function of the separation. We bring them together from infinity, they start to feel an attractive interaction, they get closer and closer, they reach their equilibrium separation, and at this point the force is zero because the force is the gradient of the potential. When you try to pa push them past this point, due to the wonders of the Pauli exclusion principle, there, there's a strong repulsive force. Atoms really don't want to be squeezed together because the electrons don't want to be squeezed together into the same quantum state. But why am I bringing this up in the context of the harmonic oscillator potential? The key thing here is if we look at the minimum of the potential and we look at small variations in the separation of the atoms, i.e. the vibrations of the atoms, around the minimum of the potential, this, oh, let me use a different colour, this we can represent as an harmonic oscillator potential. Now, of course, out here, it doesn't make much sense as we increase and increase and increase the, the separation. Obviously, we want something that goes back to zero. With the harmonic oscillator potential in its the full blown thing, it just increases to infinity without stopping. Um, so obviously out here, it's not a great approximation. Here, however, right close to the equilibrium separation, it's a very, very good approximation. And so that's just one example of where the harmonic oscillator or thinking about interactions in the context of an approximation to harmonic oscillator is, is so important. It's also exceptionally important in terms of treating the electromagnetic field. It's also exceptionally important in terms of quantum field theory, in terms of oscillations of a field, fundamental oscillations of a field. I, I, I just can't overstate how important the simple harmonic oscillator model is, which is why you see it so often in so many different contexts. So in this video, we're going to treat the quantum harmonic oscillator. Now, you did this a little bit last year and from Newton to Einstein. Core idea. Okay, it's so harmonic oscillator potential. Classically, we've got a half k x squared. It's continuous. At the quantum level, things are perhaps not surprisingly quantized. So what we have are energy levels. And as compared to the infinite potential well, where the energy levels go as n squared, here we have an equidistant separation of the energy levels. So the distance here, the delta E here compared to here compared to here, it's the same. So equal distance depth. Moreover, a difference between the harmonic oscillator 
and the um, infinite and finite potential, square potential, as we looked at before, is that in this case, we label the index as running from n equal to 1 upwards. For the harmonic oscillator, typically, we uh, label that index starting from n is equal to 0 increasing. So what we have, for reasons which I'm going to go through and show you where this comes from in this video, En for the harmonic oscillator goes as n plus a half h bar omega zero. Well, omega zero is the natural oscillation frequency. And just what that means in the context of the Hamiltonian we'll get to very soon. For now, I just want to stress two things. If we set n equal to zero, then what we have is obviously we have, we, as compared to the classic bit case where we can have zero energy, Quantum mechanically, we can't have zero energy. We have what's known as the zero point energy. And that's going to be, well, if we plug n equal to zero in there, that's going to be a half h bar omega zero. Due to the uncertainty principle, we can't know the position to infinite precision. We can't know the position. We can't say definitely it's a zero. So there's always a finite uncertainty in the position, which therefore means there's also always a finite uncertainty in the momentum. We're going to actually go through the uncertainty principle for the simple harmonic oscillator and pull out, as you might expect, delta x, delta p greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Well, equidistant, so this is a half h bar omega 0, 3 halves h bar omega 0, 5 halves h bar omega 0, 7 halves, etc. And we're going to cover a wonderfully elegant, really neat mathematical approach to solving the Schrodinger equation for the, for the harmonic oscillator. There are a number of different ways to do it. You've actually done it already in terms of coursework one. You've done it numerically using the shooting method and you've got the, the, the lowest energy eigenstate. And if you're looking for a fun thing to do over Christmas, you could take the shooting method and find the other eigenstates or a number of the other eigenstates for the harmonic oscillator potential. But that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is something which is a very tedious, painful, what's called power series method. In the notes, I've just described this very briefly in a paragraph or so. We're, we're going to forgo that. We're not going to go down that route because it's an awful lot of mathematical and algebraic pain. You do get the, um, the eigenstates and the eigenvalues out in the end. I'm going to show you a much more elegant method, which Griffiths in his quantum mechanics textbooks describes as diabolically clever. It is indeed fiendishly clever. It's really neat. Now, you've seen the harmonic oscillator potential a number of times. You've seen it, as I said, in coursework one. In fact, all of coursework one was based on it. A number of worksheet problems, worksheet four, I think, are related to the harmonic oscillator. There'll be a couple of uh, worksheet problems on worksheet eight as well related to the harmonic oscillator. So you've seen it before. You also, said, as I said, saw it in from Newton to Einstein last year. But let's step through this slowly because a number of you have sent me a couple of emails a few emails actually about aspects of the harmonic oscillator so this video gives me a chance to um, address those let me just move this bin before I walk into it okay so our Hamiltonian for the simple harmonic oscillator is our standard minus h bar squared over 2m in would we'll keep it in one dimension d squared d squared dx squared plus What's this going to be? Well, this is going to be the potential. For so what's a potential? Well, a potential, if we think classically, is this for an harmonic oscillator. Well, we've got some spring constant. Now, usually we, and you may have noticed in the co coursework, that what we do is we, let me just make this a little bit smaller, shift it across. We call that an effective spring constant because it's, you know, not a real spring many times. Um, so, for example, the um, example of the atoms interacting. So we can model the interaction between atoms as a spring with a particular stiffness. We can mo model a chemical bond as a spring of, with a particular stiffness, i.e. a particular force gradient. Hence, we talk about an effective spring constant. So... What is this? Our natural resonant frequency is given by this very simple expression, which you've seen before. The square root of our spring constant divided by our mass, which means in turn that our spring constant is equal to m omega zero squared. 
So if we take that, plug it in here, and then plug that back in there, so that's a Hamiltonian. Now, previously we've worked in what are called natural units. We said h bar is equal to m is equal to 1, and I've said, well, that's important in the context of doing calculations on computers because it's important not to be carrying around really, really small numbers which are at the limit of numerical accuracy and which the computer will find difficult to store. That's certainly one reason why I do this, but there's also another reason why working in natural units or reduced units is a good idea. It helps to really bring out the mathematical physics. It helps to bring out the physics. Instead of getting everything cluttered with constants here, there, and everywhere, and you have to carry these constants around. First of all, it makes the mathematics slightly less laborious because you don't have to write down those constants all the time, but also it gets it cuts to the essence of the relationship between different quantities. Because as I said, it doesn't matter what units we use as long as we're consistent with those units. And a number of you have emailed me to ask, to say, well, I don't quite get what's going on with, with natural units. And I understand that I, dro I, again, probably dropped you in the deep end a little bit with regard to natural units. So let me just take a little time, a few minutes, to explain what's going on with natural units in this problem. This is Hamiltonian. Describes the energy balance. Kinetic energy term, potential energy term, but energy and energy. Apples and apples. And what we have here are a couple of constants which define how much of each of those we have, how much of the kinetic and how much of the potential energy we have. But it's like an exchange rate. As long as we're consistent across this energy balance equation, we can adopt our units. So what we've done in the past, and we'll do again, is we're going to write h bar squared over m is equal to m omega zero squared, and we're going to set those equal to one. Those are our units, which means in turn, which means in turn that h bar is equal to m is equal to one. What does that mean now if we want to convert back from these natural units to um, proper units, to just traditional units? Well, good thing to do is to think dimensionally. So, I don't know, let's write it like that. That has dimensions, I'll just do it with a colon, m l to the 4 t. Make sure you check my working and make sure that that's, th that's what those dimensions work out as for this quantity. m omega 0 squared, well you can do that one by inspection. In principle you can do that one by inspection too. Um, So if we look at these two things, well, first of all, we see that, okay, we can pull out a length, um, something with dimensions of length, very, very straightforwardly, if we just divide this by this, because the m t the minus 2, m t minus 2. So our, that means our unit for length, if we want to translate back from our natural units to, to, to real length units, will be defined by, let's do it. And notice that it was to the power of 4. So what we're going to have is our h bar squared over m divided by m omega 0 squared. And what we're going to do is take the, that to the quarter of power. That will give us a, a length unit. So at the end, when we finish the calculations and we want to get back to, well, what are these in actual real traditional units in terms of meters and the like, then what we're going to do is we're going to take our, our um, values and we're just going to multiply them up by what by by these units. So what we have here is that's going to be um, h bar squared over m squared omega zero squared, and that's to power of a quarter. One square root of that gives us h bar m o sorry. One square root of that gives us h bar over m omega zero. Second square root gives us this. So that's our length unit. That's our unit of length. In the end, when we want to translate back from our natural units to length, we're going to do that. We're going to multiply through by that. So what are our dimensions for energy? Well, energy. Let's do it like this. Has dimensions m. L squared t to the minus 2. Again, so we want to think of some combination of these two that's going to pull out those dimensions. So this write down again what our dimensions for this quantity are. 
and they are M and the four bit and the dimensions for So, if we look at this thing, if we take the product of those two, we're going to have m squared, l to the fourth, t to the minus fourth. If we then get the square root of that, then we get back to these dimensions, which means then we've got our um, energy quantity. So, our energy units are going to be product of these, the square root of the product of these two things. And I will pop a very familiar formula. M's cancel, and we're left with square root of h bar squared omega zero squared is equal to h bar omega zero. You see that? Is equal to h bar omega zero. So our units of energy, conveniently, are h bar omega zero. This is why. At the start, I said that our ground state was a half h bar omega zero. Next state, n equal to one state, is three halves h bar omega zero. Next one's five halves h bar omega zero. When you did the coursework, you were getting numbers. You were aiming for an eigenvalue of a half. That's a half in natural units. h bar equal to m equal to one. These units that we've just been describing. In, in traditional units, what you have is a half h bar omega zero because in, that, in those natural units, our energy unit is h bar omega zero. So it's all consistent. So we've done position, we've done energy. The other quantity we need to think about is momentum. Well, it's mass by velocity. So mass by length by t minus one. An easy way to find the unit for momentum is to realize that the dimensions of Planck's constant actually quite similar to these. Or that. So if we could just find a way to get this L squared to an L, we've got our, our unit, we've converted from our natural unit to our traditional unit for, for momentum. And, well, we've already worked out what our unit for L is. So all we need to do is divide through Planck's constant by our unit for L, and then we'll get the units of momentum. Traditional units of momentum. So if we take our Planck's constant, we divide it through by our unit of length, which was h bar over m omega zero. That's h bar, flip this around, flip this over m omega zero over h bar, which is take that inside, take the h bar inside, and we end up with h bar m omega zero. That's our unit of momentum. So in the end, whatever units of momentum we get in terms of natural units, we multiply them through by this quantity and we get back to our traditional units for momentum. If these quantities are expressed in SI units, then we're back to SI units. Hopefully that makes sense and has cleared things up. Working in natural units like this, I know can be a little bit jarring, not least because you've been told from a level, possibly GCSE, unit, units, make sure you express it in units, etc. And that's, of course, you should. You obviously have to define what your units are. But you can change the units to make it more comfortable, to make it not just more comfortable, to make the physics come out a great deal more.